Good afternoon. I'm Colleen Cook, and I'm the Trenholm Dean of Libraries and Archives and Art. And I'm, I'm very happy to welcome you here today. This is um, the final event in the formal process of the library's feasibility study to reimagine the library for 21st century librarianship. And I'm, I'm very happy that all of you are here. I see um, lots of familiar faces and, and also also newbies, and that's all great. And people who are friends of the library, people who are alums, um, some of my dean colleagues, including um, my colleague from dentistry who just walked in. Paul, hi, welcome. Um, yeah. And, and students and colleagues who have helped us through this entire process. Um, I'm going to welcome you, talk a little bit about the project, uh, but first I'm going to ask, um, I think I'll ask Paul, who's the, he's like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna ask the project manager to introduce our architects. Paul is, wor works for facilities here, and he's the project manager for the feasibility study. So if you could introduce our colleagues here. Sure. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, so uh, starting over there, we have Jeanette, uh, Jeanette Blackburn from Shepley Bullfinch in uh, Boston. Uh, beside her is Jay Verspeak from Shepley Bullfinch as well. Um, beside him is uh, Francois Imon from EKM here in Montreal, who's actually done this space that we're uh, all congregating in. And about, yeah, that's about Jean it. Rock. Oh, and pardon me, Jean Rock is hiding in the yes. corner. And he, d he basically did all the work. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> he actually babysat the computers for days and days and hours on end as they were doing renderings. But before everything starts, I would like to introduce um, my boss, the provost, and he will just make a couple of comments. Chris Manfredi. Thanks. Uh Thank you very much, Colleen. It's a, it's a pleasure to be able to be here and say a few words before you get started with the presentation. I've had the pleasure of being involved in this feasibility study uh, from the beginning. I was a member of the steering committee and the communications committee, I think. I think somehow I was the only person who had to be on, on both committees. Uh, I was able to go to Boston with the, the team to look at some various projects that are, are relevant to this one. Um, and I want to start by congratulating Colleen on leading a, a process that I think really reached out to the community and made sure that we got uh, all of the information that we needed to get to start to think about what would a, a library uh, system for McGill University look like uh, in the 21st century. Uh, there, weren't, it, there were some uh, potholes, speed bumps along the way. Uh, we know over a couple of issues, but I think that the process really did a, a very good job in consulting with the community, in understanding what the, uh, the needs of the, uh, of the users, and, uh, uh, and the students, the uh, faculty, uh, and as well as all the technical needs. Uh, what is it exactly that the library wants to do and how, can the, and, and how does the library have to be reimagined to achieve those things? And I want to thank the architect, or architect team uh, from both Boston and Montreal for all their hard work on this and for, and for guiding us through it. Uh, I have actually, I have two titles, uh, one salary, two titles, uh, provost and vice principal academic. And this project, in a sense, uh, intersects with both of, those, both of those roles. As vice principal academic, of course, I have a, a very important role in, in overseeing the academic mission of the university. And, uni and libraries are, in many ways, at the core of the delivery of an academic mission of any university. So uh, this project is, is very much in line with uh, my vice principal academic role, as well as the fact that this is a project that will, I think, in many ways, en enhance student life and learning, and of course the student life and learning portfolio uh, directly reports into me as well. So in those parts of what I do, uh, this is a very important project and very important for us to, to think about. On the provostial side, I have a much more uh, prosaic role of taking care of things like university budgets and things like that. And of course, what you're about to see, I've seen the, I've seen the presentation, I've been involved in the process that uh, led to some of the conclusions that are, are going to be presented to you. It's an aspirational vision. Uh, it's, it's a feasibility study of, that tries to marry what our needs will be with what can be done with the site that we have. Uh, but of course, turning any aspirational reality, uh, any aspirational vision into reality requires a whole lot of steps. 
It requires a, a sound financial plan. That's where my provostial hat comes into. And uh, before we can do anything in putting any kind of aspirational vision in place, we have to put together a sound financial plan. And however we go forward, uh, it's, this project is going to require the support of the entire community. It's going to require the support of, uh, of our alumni and philanthropic supporters. It's going to require the support of students. It's going to require the support of governments. Uh, governments are going to have to provide us with authorizations to do anything if we decide to go ahead. It, governments are going to have to provide us with permissions. Uh, and one of the, uh, one of the um, criteria that the, the team used was to think through how do we minimize uh, the set of permissions that we need, and that, that fed into some of the choices that were made that you'll hear about. So there are all sorts of practical things. Um, projects like this don't usually get uh, launched until you have something like 50% of, of the funding uh, secured, and so that's something that a lot of us are going to have to think about how to get there. Uh, but I think what the team has done by consulting with the community, uh, by thinking hard about the various trade-offs and choices that have to be made, have put together a really exciting, aspirational vision uh, for a library that will enhance the academic mission of McGill University. And the next steps are to think about uh, how we approach those, uh, those realities of, of doing any kind of major project. And that will be the next, next steps. But uh, in the meantime, uh, I hope you'll enjoy the work that's, uh, the results of the work that's been done. This is the final uh, pr presentation, the final deliverable in the feasibility study. And I know that uh, you're all looking forward to seeing it. So thank you very much, and thank you for being here. Okay, we're going to take you through a presentation, and there will be several of us who are presenting. And I would like to start out by saying that if you look at the library's strategic plan, um, actually we call it a strategic intentions document, the very first, our very first over all-encompassing uh, direction is to be a user-focused organization. In other words, libraries don't exist for ourselves, we exist for our users, for the users of today, for the users of tomorrow, and actually with research libraries such as we are, for the user, for humanity, because we have some very important collections here, and you'll see some of that. We have some great data that we're gonna show you. Um, I am gonna be talking a lot about collections, but, and we will inevitably, of course, talk about bricks and mortar. But bricks and mortar in the library spaces are just about the services we provide. They provide the context and the wherewithal to do the things that we know that we need to do for 21st century librarianship for our students, for our faculty, for our community users, for Montreal. So um, I'm going to start out, and I have the privilege of beginning this presentation. and. We have called this project Fiat Lux, and Fiat Lux means let there be light. If you look at the emblature, emblature, entablature, entablature sorry, um, over the door here, this was the original drawing for Redpath Hall when it was the only library. And we found this drawing, and that did exist. It is since gone. But it means let there be light in the sense of let there be light in terms of knowledge. It's what universities, universities are all about. But it's a, perfect, it's a perfect motto or theme for our project because you'll see that a lot of what we're trying to do is to open up these spaces for light, for learning, for the mountain, for the city. Um, and I hope that you will be as excited by this as we are. Okay, so you start out um, with the 21st century student, scholarship in a digital world. Our, our principal has said that our vision is for a transformed environment for teaching and learning and for conducting research and scholarship, an environment that is sustainable, accessible, state of the art, and healthy. What we're talking about here is serving the teaching, learning, and research needs of our community. Our project is totally in alignment with uh, Principal Fortier's um, goals 
uh, her goals that are on the record. For student life and learning, her top priorities are for student life and learning, for research, engagement with the community, a learning organization, transforming space. She says, we are united by shared values and goals, the joy we have in learning and creativity and discovery. You can read the rest of it there. You've all heard it before. So what we are doing is trying to marry the overall university priorities with the needs of an organization that is truly, truly student focused. The libraries are, um, the libraries present the space where students have someone who cares for them 24 hours a day. Um, this is very much, um, as I said, it's very much in concert with, um, with the university as a whole, and I'm now going to turn it over to Jeanette, who's going to tell you a little bit about how we came up with our, with our process and the input that we got. Okay, so Colleen's going to let me talk about her picture here. Um, so you may recognize where this is. It's near the cafe in the library. And um, it was designed as a bench, but it's being used as a desk because there's nowhere else to sit. Um, and this is, you know, I think emblematic of some of the overcrowding that we've now backed up with some of the research and data we've collected in the course of doing this study. Um, so, um, as you probably all know, uh, there's been a lot of outreach to the community, a lot of um, effort put into this by the community, by the uh, library to um, communicate status of the project and to um, solicit information from folks. Um, we had the opportunity, the design team, to meet on a couple of different occasions with various groups um, on your campus, and some of the overriding themes that we heard were really about accessibility, about the library as being the democratic place where no matter what your major was, no matter what your role was, you could come here to work and to get um, seek services and that it should be that way even more. That should continue and should be updated with contemporary re uh, resources for scholarship and for technology. Um, we heard a lot about geography, about the importance of this university as being an urban university and what that meant in terms of real scarcity of space for expansion, um, for study, for work, and the importance of creating a plan that would provide the highest and best use for central campus space. Um, we also heard about diversity. We heard a very, very broad range of needs from faculty and students. And so we understand that the library is not one singular vision, but needs to accommodate a very great variety of different spaces for different styles of study, for different activities of working and research. Um, and uh, together with listening, we did quite a lot of benchmarking with the library and survey, the library did a survey of use of the library. So um, this distills it into something that I thought was really an important point. You'll see the blue and the red on the diagram of the left categorize the number of students or the percentage of individuals who are visiting the library to do work as opposed to the numbers of individuals who are here primarily to consult the collections, which are, is shown in orange. So, and then you see the space allocation. So, space allocation across the libraries, over 50% of the space is dedicated to print collections, while only 32% is dedicated to spaces for people to study and work within the library. So, um, that is never going to be never going to be apples to apples in terms of comparison, but there is a disparity there. So one of the things we've done is to look very carefully at how space is used in the library and try to um, make the collections storage more efficient and maximize space for the users of the library. Um, we also did some benchmarking uh, against other universities that are similar to McGill, um, major academic public libraries in North America, 
and we looked at the amount of space that is dedicated to seating. Um, and in most of these libraries, the range of seating that is provided as a percentage of student population is a capacity to seat between 15 and 25 percent of the student population in the library system. McGill, when you right size it uh, for, uh, that means taking into account um, seats that are really adequate, have the adequate space to be used for study. McGill provides about 9%. So one of the goals has been to try and increase the amount of seating and user space through a very broad variety of types of seating um, to be more within that range of your peers. And so the proposal that we're putting forth um, targets a seating, that, uh, seating for 16% of the student body. Um, and of course, that seating is will be developed as plans progress for the library will have a variety of different ways that it manifests itself. Here are some examples from some of your peers, things that are happening at Duke, at Princeton, at Johns Hopkins, um, quiet spaces, collaborative spaces, spaces among the collection, spaces equipped for technology, certainly places where there is a potential for visualization, for media creation, for um, data analysis, for collaboration around technology, um, spaces that invite the community in. Here's spaces at University of Pennsylvania within the library that are connected with special collections and provide places for exhibit. University of Chicago as well. Um, the new Bodleian Library at Oxford University combines um, spaces for seminars, a gift shop, a bookstore, really places that are more museum-like spaces with their special collections. So uh, that's a bit about user space. Equally important is understanding the collections that McGill has. And the, uh, what we found is that the um, collections within the library are very unique. So unlike some major university libraries where the collections may have been all really um, um, collected primarily in the last 50 years or so, um, that's not the case at McGill. They have very deep historical collections. Um, about 1.2 million titles are unique to the province of Quebec. Um, around 400,000 unique in Canada and are over a quarter of a million unique within North America. So those are very distinctive statistics that are not matched by many universities. And so the importance of the library as a steward of these print resources, not only for the community but at McGill, but for um, a much larger community, became really important. Um, and so we spent some time looking at collection space strategy. And I'll say that, you know, that's something that is not going to be ever a fixed moment in time. It will continue to evolve. So as designers and planners, we think about providing you with a space strategy that is very flexible, that will allow your uh, collection to be used, to grow, to shrink, to be stored in different ways over the life of the building. And it really has two components in it. It has a component that is um, shelving that is browsable. It's in open shelving. It is accessible. You can walk among the stacks and look at what is available there. And it also has a larger component that keeps lesser used collections in very, very high quality uh, space uh, that has the appropriate temperature and humidity control, is very efficient, and is very easily retrievable when those collections are needed. And you can see, you know, in contrast, two of these approaches, Firestone Library at Princeton University in the top photo, and um, the reading room for the robotic retrieval system at University of Chicago, which separates collection from readers, but has a mechanism to make it immediately retrievable as it's needed. So collection storage alternatives were a big part of what we looked at. And I guess I should start by saying we looked at an analysis of the amount of the cost of storing books 
in central library space on campus versus storing books in high density storage. So it's about three times as expensive, more than three times as expensive to store it in central library space. So that leads us to think carefully about open collections and um, what the priorities are to put into those collections. We also then evaluated the different high density storage systems. Um, there are storage systems that are high bay warehouse type systems, that's known as the Harvard model. Um, those would be in new construction, most likely um, in a perimeter campus space or even off campus. Um, those would operate with a bus or a van system to uh, bring those collections back to campus as they are requested. And the other is a robotic retrieval system known as an ARS for automated re retrieval system. And that is a system that barcodes the books and retrieves, the, retrieves them via a robotic system that can be installed adjacent to the existing library. Both of the systems are in use. Um, our cost analysis shows us that they are comparable in cost for McGill, although they have different um, cost implications. The off-site storage having a larger operational cost and the robotic system having a larger capital cost. Um, in the end, we feel given the amount of collection that McGill may um, ultimately need to put into a high density storage system that the robotic system is more appropriate and will provide more immediate access and retrieval of those materials as they're needed. So in summary, as you look at reallocation of space on campus, overall in the system, the proposal that we're looking at um, shifts the balance so that the majority of space now within the libraries, shown in the orange, will be allocated for users and uh, the amount of physical footprint for collection will be reduced, although the collection itself will not be reduced. It will just be stored more efficiently. So in summary of kind of the planning strategies before we start looking at some imagery of how the library physical space might be in, um, informed, I just wanted to say that we have taken a very broad look at not only uh, space possibilities within the existing libraries, but other locations on campus, the Royal Vic site, even some downtown locations and other buildings on campus, and ultimately have come back to the conclusion that McLennan Red Path is a terrific location to be the hub of the libraries. It is, has the potential to be transformed in a way that can continue to serve the university and that um, the analysis of uh, spaces of plans in which either shifted a portion of the library um, elsewhere on campus or off campus really um, were not cost effective, they were not prudent, and they did not really provide additional, um, uh, um, additional benefit for doing that. So um, the concentration has really been on the McLennan Red Path site as a center of the libraries. And I'm gonna turn it over to Jay to speak. <coughs> Yes, uh, <clears throat> so um, once we started looking at uh, trying to understand, once we began to understand the needs uh, for the library, we started to look at the physical location and the physical condition of the site and what we can possibly do to accommodate those needs. And so starting with <clears throat> the question of location, so uh, really the, the library holds a very unique location, uh, particularly for an urban campus. It sits at the intersection of the city and, and the campus. The campus itself a unique location that it straddles uh, uh, Mount Royal and the city and has this unique location uh, as far as um, uh, uh, um, that, that relationship between the, the mountain and the urban center. Uh, <clears throat> the library itself occupies uh, a frontage on Sherbrooke Street. It has an important presence to the, uh, the commons. And then as McTavish Street is being converted towards a, a pedestrian way, a campus way that's also sort of uh, expanding to become actually a, a pedestrian promenade that is proposed through the city connecting the river edge to the mountain the the library holds a, a place in that in that narrative um, so we uh, 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 took cognizance of that into um, 
uh, took cognizance of that as we were thinking about the library as, as a physical place. And um, uh, just as the mountain offers uh, an incredible viewpoint looking out over the city, so does the uh, uh, library uh, hold a unique position as a way of relating back to the mountain and uh, enhancing that relationship between um, the campus and nature. And we think of those as very positive uh, attributes that we should be uh, working with. We also spent some time, and I'll, I'll pass it off to Francois to, to talk about the physical conditions of the, uh, uh, the McLennan Red Path complex. Thank you. So uh, before we get into explaining the actual proposal, I thought it would be wise to uh, just review the building that you all, of course, know, um, which is uh, at the north end, uh, indicated by number one, is Red Path Hall, which will continue to function as a music performance and practice space. Um, Red Path Library, the 1950s building that we are in presently, and on the south, um, the McLennan Library, which uh, you see in the diagram or the three-dimensional representation on the lower left of the screen, which has really uh, demonstrated itself as being what we call, what we refer to as the workhorse of the project. Um, so if I start from the top, some of our guiding principles was to uh, try and um, restore some of the former glory that was within the Red Path Hall and in particular the envelope, the facade, sorry, of, of the building itself, the wonderful masonry that in the 1950s extension was unfortunately buried uh, beneath uh, uh, plaster and other ill-considered additions. Red Path Library itself, the 1950s uh, building, which subsequently was renovated, uh, uh, unfortunately as well, has suffered from certain uh, deficiencies that are very difficult to, corre uh, to correct. For example, the low ceiling heights, which in this space, for example, toward the campus, are only eight feet tall, whereas when we look at, at the McLennan Library, are much more generous and much more appropriate for the kind of spaces that we're imagining. And um, finally, the McLennan Library, as I evoked just a moment ago, the very robust and uh, effective system that was put into place. Unfortunately, not that seductive in terms of its architectural expression, <laughs> except for architects, perhaps, um, but extremely effective. So we, we, we will and we, we intend to focus uh, some of our energies towards uh, ameliorating that building. So uh, in order to uh, look at it in more detail, I, I don't need to remind you how difficult it is to get into this building, to get to where we are now. Um, there are many historical reasons that led to that, but essentially we have to come in through the McLennan Library and there are a series of vertical circulation uh, cores, as we call them, that uh, include elevators, some of which are accessible and others that aren't. Uh, which are represented by the large uh, red dots on the plan, and of course, the arrow that represents our circuitous uh, access through the buildings. Um, below, you see a section as if we cut through the entire complex. On the right is a representation of the Red Path Hall, and to the left, uh, the six-story McLennan Library. So again, what, one of the things that we need to point out here is in the dark blue strip, that is the only floor that is perfectly aligned between the entire complex. So none of the other floors align, uh, although they are connected, for example, at the lower level, they're always it, having stairs and very tight floor to floor space. As, uh, as was mentioned earlier, one of the things that was very important to us was to develop a project that could be implemented over a relatively short period of time. And in order to do that, we studied quite carefully what the city zoning uh, uh, regulations would permit us. Um, the two diagrams, the top one is a three-dimensional looking from the southwest corner, and the lower diagram, which is a, a, an elevation, is looking along McTavish Street. What you will notice is that 
the uh, building height is established to align with the peak of the roof of Redpath Hall. Uh, presently, Redpath Library, the 1950s building, does not attain that height and has, uh, it's impossible actually to add, add to it uh, without some significant structural modifications. Um, there's also another interesting phenomena is that in the area that's immediately behind me where the pathway that connects from McTavish to the campus, we actually can go up to the height of the McLennan Library. So these are the kind of things we were looking at in order to reduce the amount of unknowns and the amount of uh, in unpredictability in the projects that are proposed. I'm going to pass yeah. it back to Jay to prevent the options. Yeah, so uh, we, uh, <coughs> moving forward, we looked at numerous options on how we could uh, meet the, the planning goals. And uh, uh, I won't go into any detail. The, there's a master plan report that, 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 that talks about them in more detail, and there's even uh, pricing. Uh, we, we looked at cost estimates. Um, but uh, suffice it to say that we looked at everything from ranging from how can we work with just keeping the physical structures that are here and renovating them, uh, costs of renovation and bringing those to code are, are, are really significant uh, and actually quite penalizing. Uh, how can we store books off-site, on-site, underground, above ground, off campus? Um, how can we exploit the envelope that is allowed by zoning, uh, stay within those height restrictions, uh, because if we go over those height restrictions, then we enter into a very complex uh, uh, um, procedure with the city in terms of getting derogations uh, uh, to the zoning. So uh, I'm not going to go into any detail on this, but uh, uh, um, we, I, I will present sort of where we ended up. And uh, uh, in this image, then, we see here to the right uh, uh, old Red Path to the left, uh, McLennan, and we were uh, uh, obviously interested in trying to exploit as much as possible the uh, envelope that was possible uh, above Red Path, the Red Path site, uh, allowed by zoning. And the big, the big uh, important uh, piece of this is a reconstructed Red Path library that would have uh, really floors that are in cont continuity with the floors of the McLennan Library, uh, very flexible floors that will serve you for years to come, that would be uh, expanded reader space. Uh, we would integrate uh, what we call the hub, is that space right next to us where we're allowed to go up to the full height of McLennan as a way of creating a new vertical core, that is to say elevators and vertical circulation that distributes the upper floors of the building from one central point. Uh, we looked at a, uh, an idea about a kind of atrium exhibit space that could be built uh, uh, to the front side of, of um, <coughs> um, uh, Red Path. And uh, there, what we can be doing by, by doing that is revealing the uh, historic facades, bringing them back to their former glory and, and really part of uh, an integral part of the idea. The, uh, um, obviously, the terrace is an important uh, uh, meeting place for the university. We would keep the terrace as a, uh, a component to the overall complex. Ultimately, we are looking at, in order to store the number of books and open up the amount of user space we're trying to get, uh, in, the solution that we're recommending is an underground automatic retrieval system. It would be buried under the commons. Uh, uh, you wouldn't see it but it would have uh, uh, underground connectivity to the library to deliver books uh, to the upper floor. So those are the basic components. And the other thing we were thinking about is how could these be um, uh, uh, um, phased as nuggets, uh, uh, separate nuggets that could happen as a phasing while uh, funding becomes available. So, um, and this also with a thinking that the library has to remain continuously operational throughout these operations. So all that kind of, there's a quite a bit of complexity that goes into all of this. It's a, it's a, it's a Chinese puzzle, <laughs> to tell you the truth. Uh, but um, all that being said, we are trying to look for, apart from a master plan being a roadmap, also being an aspirational vision for what is, is possible on this, on this site. Um, 
one of them being the re real concept that we are interested in here is uh, in this sketch you can see we have McLennan, the big box on the right. We have uh, uh, Redpath and Redpath Hall on the left. And the idea is to create a central space that becomes really the new portal uh, to the library off McTavish Street, which you see to the bottom, the commons being sort of at the top side. And that one would move into a central space which becomes a main distribution point for people, orientation place, where you could then go either to the right into McLennan, which would take you to the upper floors, uh, where there would be uh, browsable collections, there would be uh, plentiful user space. Or to the left, you would move into Redpath Hall, uh, Ruth into Redpath, and the uh, lower wing of Redpath would continue to be used as uh, special reading rooms for special collections. The idea is to give identity of exhibition space and event space and special collections its own kind of identity in the old Redpath. Um, <coughs> Redpath Hall itself would remain intact as it currently is as a, 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 a concert venue. Uh, or a music practice venue. Uh, so those are the sort of the basic ideas. Uh, you can see here the uh, actual proposition is to move the elevator core out of the middle of, of McLennan and move it out into this hub space so it's in a central place where one can move up and distribute uh, on the upper floors uh, between uh, Redpath and McLennan. Um, so this, this is just, uh, it's not a final design. It's uh, trying to be, uh, it's, it's expressing an aspiration. Uh, this idea that from McLennan Street, um, the library becomes a portal to the campus, that it has a transparency that you can move through, you can see the commons beyond, that uh, for people arriving to navigate through the building, it becomes immediately evident where you go. Uh, the other part of it is to, um, to, uh, uh, structures in such a way that we can start to reveal some of the historic facades of old Red Path. You can see the gable end here would be restored because we're, we're now making it visible where currently it's hidden. <laughs> um, uh, also from the campus side, we would be preserving the importance of the terrace, uh, but um, you can see uh, the atrium uh, events, uh, exhibition space, it's a multi-purpose space, uh, um, by its transparency allows us to reveal those facades of historic red path that are now hidden from view. Um, uh, then uh, <clears throat> the main body of the red path building which uh, steps up to meet the height of the McLennan building uh, also uh, affords uh, a, a, a very visible and understandable navigation uh, system within the building, a cascading stair uh, and also stepped forum that takes you up to the upper floors. And the idea would be that uh, as you move up through the building, you find quieter spaces. As you're at the lower ends of the building, they're more active and more uh, uh, public in nature. Um, so this uh, vision here uh, starts to illustrate the experience of entering, uh, the idea that uh, as McTavish becomes more and more pedestrianized, uh, to activate it with a, a cafe at the lower level. You can move through to the cyber tech, basically it would be reconstituting. It's a very similar space to what we have here. Uh, you can move through into the cyber space, cyber tech. Uh, steps moving up to the upper level, the terrace level, which you see to the upper right, would then be that sort of bridge link that creates a, the continuity of connectivity between uh, old Red Path and, and McLennan. Uh, and you can see in the upper left the idea of a, a stepped form that can be for uh, informal and community presentations, like we're doing right here, could to actually have a place um, for the whole community. Then as we move into the idea of this exhibition event space uh, that now reveals the historic facades of uh, old Red Path and becomes part of that space, uh, also, also, gives this very, um, well, we currently at the building right now, where we are, it's very sort of introverted and closed off, a very open relationship to the campus, really enjoying that relationship to the commons. Uh, then as one moves up to the upper floors, very open, simple uh, plans of uh, plateaus that can be flexible, easily 
uh, transformed into different kinds of uses for study space, for quiet study, active, group study, individual study. All those sort of ranges of spaces would be uh, possible on these upper floors. And really capitalizing on this openness and relationship to the mountain and to the commons uh, so that they, it really becomes enjoyable space not only to, work, to, to be in, to work in, and spend long hours of study. Uh, ultimately, the top floor uh, being a space that it would be quieter for more uh, uh, quiet study. Um, again, kind of, kind of being in the upper levels of the building, enjoying those, those views back to, uh, to the mountain. Um, and then finally, uh, uh, because we will have removed the elevator and stair core out of um, McLennan, we can start to think about renovation projects within McLennan and those can be done sort of uh, piecemeal that start to uh, make better use of that space. And we think actually McLennan, despite its sort of brutality, can be tamed uh, with some you know, tactile materials, woods, uh, uh, nice materials that have sort of uh, a, human, a human, uh, humanizing touch to them. So I, I think I, I hold hope for McLennan. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, so that, that uh, I, won't, I won't bore you with this chart, but uh, that basically is sort of trying to establish a, a vision uh, for what is possible on this site. Um, and, and with that, I will hand it back maybe to Colleen. Would you like to conclude, perhaps? Well, I just have to, um, um, again, say thank you to all my colleagues. And this is a project, again, which we have worked on for a long time. And we have taken all the input that we possibly could, but we're here to, to take other input. Um, again, this is the best that we can come up with at this point in time. Um, things are mutable as, as events unfold, but this gives you an idea of where we're going with, with the idea of fiat looks, let there be light. Um, I find it very compelling and very exciting, um, the ideas of, of taking these, these wonderful heritage buildings that are so emblematic of McGill, opening them up and using space in very efficient ways on behalf of the whole campus. So for instance, the, um, the exhibit space, he, uh, that's the reading room, this space. This is a space that would be used by the campus as a whole for all sorts of events. It would also be the space that, that you would walk through going from McTavish to the green and then up. Um, so when you go through the building as, as you have to go through the circuitous path, uh, you know, kind of knowing which way you need to go and making sure that, that you can get up and down stairs or whatever, it would be, this would just be the way that you would go. And it would be open, there would be exhibit. this is where there would be exhibits. The campus could use this, music could use it for part of their uh, program, for part of their programming. This is probably the space that would be open 24 hours a day for students. It's just, there's just so much there just in this space, just in this one space that, um, that I just think brings so much of all the wonderful things about McGill together. Um, and it's such an iconic spot at Sherbrooke and McTavish. And I find it very compelling too with, um, we're trying to not use the word promenade or ban, but from the, I will anyway, from the, the city of Montreal itself is putting um, several north-south axes through the city. The first one goes from, is a pedestrian area that comes from, from the water up to the mountain and it goes along McTavish. So it's right here, right here that we will be, um, that we'll be bringing the city and the library and, and the university together. So, so I'm going to open it up to any sorts of questions. Um, there's not a question that you should not feel like you cannot ask. And particularly now that there are all the experts here, um, even my boss is here, just in case there are any questions you might want to ask administrators or architects or facilities people or librarians or whatever. Yes? Are these images going to be on the website? Is this... Uh, this the power to present? Yes. Uh, we plan on getting it up at 5, right, today. 
we, we didn't want any spoilers. So, and we do have a, a book too that, uh, that's a kind of a quick and dirty uh, promotional document that you will get, that you can pick up a copy of as you leave. We have it in both French and English. And um, we didn't want to pass it out beforehand because you would, be a, you would have been looking through it instead of paying attention to us up here. So, um, other questions? Or comments? Yes? Um, perhaps this is already getting a little too specific, but just looking at the visual rendering, so much of it is um, seems to be a line from an actual light. And once we get into the winter months, it's really dark here. So basically, of course, we don't have any iron yet. And I'm just curious what kind of, of lighting you're looking to make for such big open space as you can see. That's not a uh, my that's well, uh, lighting is an art in itself uh, uh, that holds tremendous importance. Uh, obviously, um, uh, the more you can capture daylight, harvest daylight as a way of, of, of lighting, bringing interior light into a space, the, the less energy uh, you're using. Um, uh, obviously, um, on the long winter nights, there would have to be a very careful kind of understanding of how one provides light levels that are... Uh, uh, adequate. I mean, generally, one goes when one, one goes towards artificial lighting. Uh, uh, we're going more towards LEDs. There is a way to create intimacy within those spaces by creating low-level lighting, indirect lighting, and not, in, in fact, sort of creating a bit of a, a contrast between day and night is is a good thing. Uh, it doesn't have to be that you're always creating um, high light levels, but they have to be comfortable light levels. I'm, you know, obviously. It, it's when you go into design, into dig deeper into design, that you start to really tackle those those issues. But uh, there are very good solutions for lighting in libraries that create comfortable environments. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but yes, Nick. Um, the question was, what's the capacity uh, with our automatic, for our suggested automatic retrieval system compared to what we have right now? It would be built so that we would have uh, capacity to increase by a third. Um, the collections, yes and no. Um, Depending upon, yeah, I mean, we, we obviously would want to move some of the least used uh, materials from our other libraries to open up more user space within those libraries. The more we do that, the sooner we fill this space up. So um, we are buying fewer and fewer print materials. However, they're never going to go away. I think we will always be buying them. And despite the fact that we try to buy everything that we can digitally, we still add between 40 and 50,000 print books a year. Um, so, so, yeah, but if we build this, we will have capacity for a very long time. Just a follow up in relationship to user space. Mm -hmm. When you free up less space to buy, how much does it increase? Um, okay, so the question was when we put books into storage and we free up user space, we increase user space by... I think it really goes back maybe to the last pie chart. Whoops. Okay, so this is system-wide, although um, the McLennan Red Path um, library is similar to system-wide. So user space increases from 32% to 56%. In square meters, it's about double the amount that is there now. <coughs> and then um, the space allocated for collection is shrinking to about half of what is currently allocated in square meters <coughs> across the system. The, uh, effective, uh, effective space uh, seats is going from 1865 to the current proportion number. Yeah. So it's a it's pretty dramatic. Go back to there. Other questions? Yes. So, question.
question from I could, yeah. I could, well, just a, a question from University Advancement. That space there, do you envision anyone, including us, being able to use that like for events and public outreach? Events? Yes. <laughs> yes. All right. Yes, all you have to do is raise the money for it. <laughs> that's what that's what the provost the provost just suggested it. You know, but no, we, we are very, very aware that that kind of space does not exist easily on this campus and that we're constantly going out to hotels and other spaces for those sorts of events and we would save resources. But also, this is home. I mean, this is us. This, there is nothing, I don't think, more iconic for this campus than, than the Red Path um, Victorian and Georgian um, additions, which will be unveiled with this project. It's, it's, I have to admit, I, I love this space. I'm very partial to it. Um, okay, yes. Yeah, um, <laughs> I have, my, my aunt is a, an av a avid bird uh, watcher and always criticizing me about <laughs> glass buildings. Um, <laughs> and, uh, well, there are things you can do now with glass which involve frit patterning and the like that give glass um, uh, of two birds a recognizable surface. Uh, and so... Um, uh, it is a concern, and, and there's nothing worse than something like this where you're walking along the terrace and you're constantly picking up dead pigeons uh, that would need to be addressed. So, I mean, it's, it's a, design, uh, uh, a design concern that we're all aware of um, uh, and does need to be addressed, and it's a very good point, and, and my aunt would be very happy uh, that you made that comment. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Um, so, yes, the library will need to be built in phases, and, oh, let me, uh, so the question was, are there any um, initial thoughts about how the building would be staged so that the library could remain occupied and be built in phases? So, um, yes, so that would be the way that it would be approached. The uh, nature of the complex actually lends itself really easily to that because it does have these distinct components has McLennan that was built as an entity by itself, the Red Path Hall piece, Red Path Library, and then the new piece, the uh, robotic retrieval system. So we would approach it by looking at those pieces and looking at building it as discrete components. So um, for instance, if we would build the new Red Path Hall piece first, then that could create, I'm sorry, the new Red Path Library piece first, that would create a safe haven for students to study in while construction was happening elsewhere. Um, if the robotic retrieval system is one of the early phases, then that would be um, a way to keep books protected and empty out spaces, moving collection into its permanent home as uh, renovation is done. So um, until we really understand the funding strategy and which pieces maybe the university is able to raise funding for first and what the um, amount is, then it's a little hard to really pin it down, but we would look at that funding strategy and then we would also marry it with the co decisions about constructability and about the operations of the library and the needs of the occupants to come up with a plan, you know, pretty early in the design phases.
want me to take you want to take it? I take oh, the second one. Okay, so the, the, there were two questions. The second one um, was about if there has been research done on the robotic retrieval system and if materials are actually um, accessed less once they're put into one of those systems. The, we haven't done exhaustive research, but um, we know that at um, North Carolina State University, which just um, built a new library that has um, the majority of the collections in robotic retrieval, they've actually had the requests and the use of those materials increase. And um, that's maybe a little counterintuitive, but we think because it's now so easy. You just, you know, look at your computer screen or your iPad or your smartphone and you click on the request button and it's delivered. So there's some logic in that. I would say for music, maybe Colleen can answer this more specifically, but there may be issues more about browsing and cataloging that may come into effect. Um, and so I'll let you answer the second one. I mean, music, um, music's special. I don't know what, I, you know, I know that you may not, you don't want to say you're special, but if you're, if you're, I mean, uh, Music, um, music students need access to scores. They're putting, pulling stuff out. I mean, that's not a typical sort of use, and we wouldn't put those kind of materials in storage necessarily. Um, what we do, we will decide um, how to put things in storage based upon um, good data and... and um, discussions with our users. But for instance, one of the things that we know is that 40% of our collection has not circulated in the past 20 years. That, and you are going to say, but that does not mean that someone didn't pick it up off the shelf and put it back. And yes, we know that. We do know that. But we also, but there are also rules of thumb for those sort of browsing mechanisms as well. And we will study all of this. Um, but as I said, there are different disciplines use materials in different ways. And it's not one size fits all, nor will it ever be. Yes. I think it's a good thing that Jay's actually a Canadian, so. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, the, 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 the muck and mud that gets tracked in and, and all the rest. Uh, well, um, uh, most of that is, is trying to address it locally. Uh, uh, that's one of the reasons, perhaps, that cramped space doesn't work so well. People come in with their backpacks and their coats, and they need a place to put them down. And usually they bring them with them. I mean, it's, you, one could obviously... I mean, like a museum, you could create a, you know, a, 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 um, a, yeah, a cloakroom uh, where people deposit their stuff, but that's unlikely to work in a library. I mean, people just carry their stuff with them, and you have to plan for that. I don't know. Maybe Jeanette has a better answer. I have a good idea. Um, what we're seeing a lot of libraries do is to create locker space, um, and that even sometimes the lockers have charging in them, so you can not only put your coats and boots and things like that in there, but you can also put your um, mobile devices in there and charge them while you're, while, when you need to, while they're locked up securely. So that might be something the library thinks about. We're going to take two or three more questions if we've got them. Yes. Um, I would agree that Redpath, uh, Redpath McLennan is the heart of the campus and the heart of the libraries, but has any thought been given to this 50-year-long 50 50 year master plan to the other libraries? I'm. I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question. The other libraries. Um, the other, uh, so have we thought about the other libraries in this plan? Yes. Um, yes, uh, we have, the, the, in, the plan was to look at the system of libraries in terms of basic um, user sp uh, space that we would need for users, space that we would need for collections, and we've accommodated that in terms of what we think that we need in terms of the constellation of libraries, but in terms of actually renovating other libraries, it, that's a little bit of a bridge too far at this point. Okay, although, for instance, we know that 
if we moved a lot of materials out of Schulich, for instance, that we would go in and we would try, we will convert those place, spaces to user spaces as quickly as we possibly could. Um, in that same vein, what's the timeline for this for these phases, or does that depend on funding? Again, um, the timeline is dependent upon funding, and we don't have that plan yet. We're just now entering into a business plan, and and right now this is aspirational. It's what we think we have. Ab we have we have a very 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 clear idea of what our needs are now. Um, we know, before we started this project, we had an intuitive feel that we were really undersized in terms of user space, that our buildings weren't efficient and they didn't work for us, that in terms of just usability, but also in terms of energy inefficiency, we knew that our collections, uh, we felt our collections were pretty unique, but we couldn't say for sure. We've done studies, we now know these things, we know them, we have real data. Um, and we know where we need to go. It really is, it will be a series of phases and the answer to that will be everybody will have to participate in it. We'll have to be working with our alums, with, with people who are, the, who are friends of the university, um, with philanthropists, with faculty, with students. They will all have to be part of the answer to this, to this issue. Thank anybody you. else want to comment? Any more on that? Okay, okay. It would be great to have this done for the bicentennial of the university. <laughs> yeah, so what we need is a lot of people to, we needed to go out and sell that, that reading room big time, uh, the exhibit space. There were, yes, there, but there was a couple of other questions here. Yes, can I is, get this first? Is Miguel subject to height relate, um, restrictions that his neighbors are not subject to? Actually, uh, McGill um, negotiated a special zoning agreement, which is codified in a document. Uh, I forget the number. Uh, Paul might remember it. So the, the information that we presented as far as uh, zoning height limitations come directly from that agreement. But why would McGill restrict itself in terms, because just next, next street over, we have high rises. Yeah, I think the, the issue here is that if we submit ourselves to, uh, what's the word, les alias, the, the, the kind of, <laughs> the winds of, the winds of uh, decisions that are outside of our purvey, i.e. if we have to go into public consultation or other types of mechanisms that we would necessarily have to go to if we wanted to add, for example, two stories to the McLennan Library, we ruled that out as too much of a risky operation. That was a decision that we made. I'm not, un I don't, I'm not understanding why that would be risky. Sorry to, uh, I, I don't want to bore everyone, but zoning is typically very boring uh, stuff. And so the reason why, pardon me, um, the reason why our zoning heights are lower than, say, right across the street is due to the fact that we're within a historic and natural zone. Okay. Um, which is defined of the mountain and it continues down to our campus and the border is actually along McTavish Street and then along Sherbrooke Street. So, so that makes we're, sense then. Yeah, we're quite yeah. restricted. Okay, thank you. No <coughs> yeah, you'd learn something every time I listen to these. So Nick, do you have a last question? Or? So the question is about energy standards and achievements of efficiencies. Well, I think that would be p partly up to, to the university's uh, uh, requirements. But uh, we, uh, most of our projects now are meeting uh, uh, LEED standards. We set that up as a, as, a, as a target at the beginning of a project. Uh, we energy model projects to meet those, those goals whether it's 30% energy reduction, 40%, whatever, if you want to go to lead gold or lead uh, platinum or however far you want to go, is going to, to set, set, set the, goal, the target. So, and the sorry? And the price. Yeah, and, and, well, it, 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 yeah, and that, and that threshold, uh, we're finding more and more we're able to think, achieve lead gold 
without really adding cost to a project, uh, just using uh, current current uh, um, technologies that are available. Uh, obviously, you want to set the bar higher. There there can be a cost to that. Uh, if it's uh, you know putting solar panels on the roof everywhere, that starts to to take us in a different place. Uh, but certainly, overall, uh, what we're we're uh, we would be seeing here is a, a vast improvement over energy consumption from what you've got today. It, when people laugh, that's, I don't know. Okay, so I think that, I think that we've come to an end here of our, of our open forum. And I just, again, have to very much thank my colleagues. It has been an incredible pleasure for me, a personal pleasure to work with these very smart, interesting people. And, uh, we value and that we have we have valued we do value and we will value your input along the whole process with this and with that we've got um, our website link which will be coming up at five and you'll be able to get it to it from the library's webpage in about 20 minutes you'll be able to get to it and uh, please send in cards, letters, uh, give us your comments. And there are several things on, on that website, uh, links to um, uh, the symposium that we had on the future of the library and several other, um, several other things, the presentations that, that I think that you can use if you would like. And there is a promotional document, a brochure at the back of the room if you want to take one. Be sure and share it because we don't have a zillion copies, but, um, but please feel free. And thank you all very much.